Thank you, Rod. Good morning. Um, it has been, it's an honor to be a part of this day. As the venue curator for Soul of the Nation at Crystal Bridges, I've had the pleasure of working closely with Tate Modern curators, Mark Godfrey and Zoe Whitley, in bringing this monumental exhibition from London to Bentonville. The format of the day is designed for the artists to have the maximum amount of conversation time, so we will not be having audience Q&A. However, we encourage you to continue the conversation at our lunch break at noon or after the symposium ends. This exhibition is open all day for your viewing pleasure. Mark and Zoe will kick off the symposium with a brief presentation on the Tate's organization of the exhibition. Mark is curator of international art at Tate Modern and has curated major exhibitions of works by American, German, British, Mexican, and Italian artists. He has also worked on many of the displays in the energy and process wing at Tate Modern and on displays of video installations by Omar Fast and Beryl Korat. Zoe Whitley, PhD, is, a cura is curator of international art at Tate Modern and has worked in a unique capacity at Tate as curator of contemporary British art and as research curator of Africa. In addition to co-curating Soul of a Nation, she co-curated the critically acclaimed exhibition the Shadows Took Shape at the Studio Museum in Harlem in 2013 to 14. It really was a great <laughs> exhibition. <laughs> and prior to that, she was a curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum for a decade. There, she curated numerous exhibitions and authored several books. Please join me in welcoming Mark and Zoe. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, we'd really just like to thank absolutely everyone here at Crystal Bridges. It really is a privilege to have the exhibition showing here in the United States. And as Darren said so frankly and passionately last night, that wasn't a given. So we are grateful to Alice Walton and Rod Bigelow, the Ford Foundation, and everyone who's made that possible. Thank you so much. Um, this is a really joyous occasion, so it's a little bit of a challenge to start on what may seem to be a sad note, but something that we say time and again, and is completely true, is that this exhibition begins and ends with the artists who are here. We're so fortunate that so many of them are here with us today on the front row. But we also felt it was very important for us to take a moment, because it has been a a very emotional year um, and the fact that there's something very important you know they say never meet your heroes <laughs> Mark and I have gotten to meet so many of our heroes and it's been totally worth it um, but there are a number of people who have died this year and they very fundamentally informed the research that um, you see before you in the galleries just there so we wanted to take a moment to um, first of all recognize um, Jack Whitten and Robert Sangstack, <laughs> Barclay Hendricks, <laughs> Daniel Leroux Johnson, <laughs> and Barbara Jones Hogu. Um, one of the things that informed so much of not only how we approached the exhibition catalog and the research that's contained within it, but also the exhibition labels was that we wanted to imbue as much as possible the spirit of our research process and the generosity that so many artists have shown us. Um, Wadsworth and Jay Gerald are here with us and their recollection is one of many that's included in the exhibition catalog. But for instance, uh, in the London presentation, it was Barbara Jones Hogu's quote that opens the room on Africobra. So we have her words kind of activating the space saying, is it possible for us to set aside ego and to work collectively rather than for self? The answer is yes, we can. So in the artist's own words, we were able to imbue so much more than any amount of curatorial or art historical theory. Um, same thing was true with Barclay Hendricks's work um, that you see there. Um, you have What's Going On, beautiful work that is also included in the exhibition. And we opened his room with a quote that he'd said to me during the course of an interview, and it was, 
incredibly uh, profound, because he said he was never interested in speaking for all black people. He was trying to be the best painter that he possibly could be. And that's what he wanted people to know. And so it was important for us to really relay that in an unmediated manner. Um, the same is true with having been fortunate enough to do studio visits with Daniel LaRue Johnson. Um, I've only met Jack Whitten once in his studio prior to his coming to London. Mark had spent um, quite a long time with us. But um, if I can do a plug for the artist films that have been possible um, because of Ford Foundation's generosity, one of them that features Jack Whitten that was made by a young British filmmaker named Andy Mundy Castle is really a joy to behold. And we were in the gallery with him, and Jack, who was recently recovered from an illness, was holding his cane and showing us how the developer would work, how he had made, fashioned this squeegee to rake um, the acrylic paint across the surface. And these are moments that we're then, again, because of Ford Foundation, able to share with all of you. And all of those moments, um, these anecdotes, the fact that it's real people making the work and kind of sharing their inspiration with us is how we were able to put the exhibition together. Thank you, Zoe. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about the origins of the exhibition, how the idea came about. And it really came about in the process of building the permanent collection of the Tate. Uh, for the last few years, I've worked particularly on our North American collection. And as you might imagine, the way we represented the art of the 60s and the 70s was largely through the artists who were well known because they had the opportunities to exhibit in Europe. So we've got great works by Mark Rothko, Roy Lichtenstein, Andy Warhol, and so on. But in the last five or six years, and I wanted to also recognize the help of the people who've enabled us to do this, three of them are here, Bob Rennie, Fred Jafrida, and Pamela Joyner. Um, we've been able to add to the collection uh, and to really recalibrate how we look at North American art and uh, in the context of global uh, uh, modern and contemporary art through the acquisitions of major works by Norman Lewis, Barclay Hendricks, uh, Romare Bearden, Sengen and Goody, and these sometimes through uh, funding that we have and sometimes through very generous gifts. Um, <coughs> Sam Gilliam and just yeah, two days ago we were able to announce the acquisition of a work by Mel Edwards that you see here. Now whenever we do research on acquisitions, and I'm sure this is the same for many colleagues uh, working in other museums, we have to write quite substantial documents to justify why we're asking people to give us money so we can do this. And in the course of um, writing those documents and doing that research, I began to read quite deeply into the literature of the time, and especially the writings by artists about the different positions uh, in uh, art at that moment. So, you know, it, it, it really became apparent that these artists were not just making great work, but really wrestling in their writing with the stakes of what it meant to be an artist at that moment. Writings by Frank Bowling, Tom Lloyd, uh, Linda Cousins. Uh, I'm showing you a slide of a sliver of a text by Emery Douglas um, and uh, Jeff Donaldson's uh, Ten in Search of a Nation, which was the sort of main text for the launch of Afri-Cobra. And um, the research on this is leading me to, uh, I'm in the middle of uh, researching an anthology, uh, co-edited with Ali Biswas, who's somewhere in the room, uh, which is going to be funded by a vodka company, Absolute. <laughs> um, but at a certain point, my research into these uh, artist texts and the work we've done on acquisitions led to the idea that there might be an exhibition idea in this research and an exhibition idea that would look at different artists working in different cities, different groupings, and many different debates around the time. So it all started with research for the Tate Collection, and uh, this is something that we want to continue and continue. We've got many other works that we want to bring into the collection. Anyone who can help with that will speak, speak to me afterwards. <laughs> Um, as you'll see in the exhibition, when you go into the first room, um, immediately you're starting to discuss, discover artist groups and what artists were saying at the time. Um, and there were some foundational, not only texts, but also exhibitions um, and exhibition makers. There are a number of them in this room. 
Um, and that, that has been really formative in our thinking. Um, we have historians like Deborah Willis, who's there in the front row. Um, Mary Schmidt Campbell is here. Um, and on the next slide, you know, um, images of a turbulent decade, tradition and conflict was something that was so important to our thinking. Um, having worked uh, closely with Frank Bowling, thinking about his own exhibition history in the United States, despite being um, a painter of British Guyanese origin, with exhibitions like Five Plus One, um, but also some American history and others. And there's a selection of the works that you can see here. The Deluxe Show being one that took place in Texas, not too far away. Three graphic artists at LACMA. And again, the genesis of these exhibitions started to reveal such an important history. Um, hearing directly from people who really laid the groundwork for what became the study of African American art history, um, including David Driscoll, but also James Porter before him, Lois Maylou Jones, um, thinking of all of these people and the way that they were able to at a certain time really not only make the art and make the art history, but then also write it as well. Um, Samela Lewis, who also has a recollection in the exhibition catalog. All of these voices were so important to capture in terms of the work that this has built on. We aren't sitting here before you in any way to say that this is something that you know, we'd only discovered in the pages of what the artists have written. Many people have been working on this research for years, and this, we owe that debt. You know, this is what we we're picking up and building upon. Um, with something like Three Graphic Artists, we were also able to acknowledge people who were perhaps far less well known, like Cecil Ferguson, who was actually a preparator at LACMA. So in a context where it was not institutionally possible because of institutional racism, and we need to speak these words, um, he was able to create a group of local individuals to really hold LACMA to account. And certainly, Benny Andrews with the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition was also able to do that. And those histories are completely foundational and knitted into um, the way in which we were able to tell the story in the exhibition. So we look back to these exhibitions and also to some of the criticisms around them. Um, the uh, criticisms particularly of the show that was at the Whitney, which was seen as a sort of general survey rather than a really carefu carefully curated uh, exhibition. That's the one uh, Contemporary Black Artists in America that was in 71. But of course, in the process of our research, we also looked at very recent exhibitions, and we got to go to some of them, um, particularly, ex I mean, Zoe's mentioned Mary Schmidt Campbell's Tradition and Conflict, but we were also Kelly. able to see a few shows that Kelly Jones uh, was, has curated, particularly Now Dig This, which many of you will have seen, which was a great exhibition looking at Los Angeles and was part of Pacific Standard Time, and uh, Witness uh, at the Brooklyn Museum, and our exhibition will also travel to the Brooklyn Museum. We didn't have access to We Wanted a Revolution because that was planned at the same time as our exhibition. Um, and uh, thinking about these shows helped us sort of refine what we wanted to do that was slightly different from these shows, in as much as, very importantly, we wanted to look uh, across the United States rather than at one particular city. And most importantly, I think, we wanted to put the real focus on art and artist groups and let the political background uh, be slightly in the background to that, which is, I think, a different model to witness, which puts socio-political material up front uh, rather than um, slightly in the background. So here are some of the... We're not going to show you slides of the exhibition at the Tate because, because you can see it here. a wonderful exhibition here. <laughs> but some of the... Um, the main principles, curatorial principles that we worked with, as I've said, to really focus on art and to make it look absolutely fantastic so that you know, when people came uh, into the Tate, they were really just bowled over by the power of the work and it looking fantastic and fresh. Um, rooms were either grouped around artist groups working in a particular city at a particular time where we knew there was a dialogue, for instance, Bearden and Norman Lewis and Reginald Gammon working in black and white for the first Spiral show. Or uh, rooms were artists that didn't know each other but were, work, were tackling the same question. For instance, um, 
how art might be distributed on the streets outside of institutions, a question that Emery Douglas was interested in, but a question that the artists who painted the Wall of Respect in Chicago were also interested in. Yeah, so, um, as you can see, there are a number of main principles, and uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, because it's so exciting, we're literally front page news. I don't know if you all saw the Democrat Gazette this morning, but Professor Dana Chandler is on the cover, um, as well as Faith Ringgold's painting, The Flag is Bleeding, um, so I urge you to check it out above the fold and everything, full color picture. Um, it's, it's exciting, this is a great moment that people are interested in this material. Um, and so in terms of how we wanted to really explain what it was that was happening in the rooms and so that you're able to be led by the art that's in the room, we were really trying to think about how there was a set of questions that were kind of posed and mulled over and refuted and reconceived that really had to do with whether a black aesthetic existed. Um, is there such a thing as a Negro art, as uh, the spiral members posed it? Is there black art? Is there Afro-American art? Is there African-American art? The fact that these, these questions were, were live and were being posed, and um, we have five words in the way that we presented it that I think are, are valuable. Um, they gave no single answer. And we use the exhibition and the artwork within that to really allow for the texture and complexity and nuance and beauty of not trying to flatten it out, not trying to have one answer or to pretend that there was always harmony and that there wasn't a kind of generative <coughs> energy from the discord. Um, and this is something that we wanted to uh, really shine a light on and really to, to make it as, as clear as possible, that it's possible to engage with this material without having to um, put it into something that's 140 characters or less, that it can kind of spill out and be messy, and that's part of the joy and importance of it. And the question of uh, institutions was very important. You know, uh, should the artists campaign against what was perceived to be racist white institutions, what, what was racist white yeah. institutions at the time, <laughs> looking at the campaigns of Benny Andrews, as you've said, the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition. But another idea was to form new institutions like the Studio Mu Museum in Harlem, or... Uh, we also got to meet Betty Blayton, who's someone else I'd be happy to mention that we were fortunate to meet before she passed away and she's been part of other important exhibitions like Magnetic Fields. And we see this exhibition very much as part of a constellation of exhibitions, both group exhibitions like We Wanted a Revolution, but also solo exhibitions, some of which have happened, some of which are in the process of happening. So um, Ian White, who's been so generous to us, and Charles White's exhibition is about to take place, or colleagues esteemed and also friends, Valerie Cassell Oliver and Naomi Beckwith, who are about to um, co-curate the major um, solo retrospective of Howard Dina Pindell. All of these pieces are important. Back to institutions, the commercial institution or the artist-run institution is also a subject of the exhibition, from the spiral artists organizing their own space to show their own work, to the various projects that Afri Cobra did, to uh, the Brockman Gallery in Los Angeles and other galleries in LA that became a focal points, allowing a platform for black artists, and finishing with uh, Linda Good Bryant's jam just above Midtown, which was such a, a, a real amazing hotbed of activity across so many different experimental media from the 70s to the mid 80s. That's another running theme through the exhibition. Um, the, the relation of artists to institutions and the creation of new ones. And um, you know, very quickly, we, we, we opted at the Tate for 12 rooms. Every, the, the, the show will look different in each of its venues because we're all working with different architectural situations. What we wanted at the Tate was for moments of compression and intensity, and then for the, the show to sort of open out into um, you know, wonderful cinematic moments where the spaces uh, were, were suddenly bigger and you'd get a, a very different experience of the work. We were able to do that because of our um, architecture. But room by room, we started with Spiral in 1965. They'd formed in 1963. 
Um, so the start point wasn't the March on Washington. It was the spiral group that formed as a result of thinking about the March on Washington. <laughs> Broadly speaking, it was chronological, but you'd also find works, for instance, by Roy de Carava halfway through the show that slightly predated 1963. Uh, and um, <coughs> we ended with um, just above Midtown, as, as we said, just before the beginnings of uh, what we perceive to be a new generation of artists represented here by Glenn Ligon and others who were bringing in um, sort of a post-pictures generation consciousness, a, a different type of theoretical uh, practice in, into their art making alongside being painters and sculptors and so on. That was explaining the beginning point and the end point. And something that coheres and kind of ebbs and flows throughout the exhibition is the kind of relationship and tensions and slackenings between abstraction and figuration. And that's something that plays out in different ways, room by room as well. Another key point is that we didn't want just to do a general survey of all the important artists of the time. And I'm sure people in the room will be thinking, why didn't you include this person? Why didn't you include that person? Where possible, we wanted each artist to be represented at least twice so that one could see a trajectory of work, either no, two or three twice. works at the same time or works at different periods. Even just, for instance, Melvin Edwards' Lynch fragments from 63 to 65 and then the curtain from 69 shows a different moment in the work. We could have made a different, um, a different decision and not had four works by Melvin Edwards but had works by other artists instead. But we wanted to give our viewers the sense of uh, how these artists didn't just work at one point, but were working um, in different moments. Hammond's being another one who's in the three graphic artist room with his body prints, but then in the just above Midtown room with the amazing works he made with uh, hair and greasy bags, uh, fried chicken bones, and so on. And that's as important for the reason for the symposium today that in no way are we trying to preserve an aspect, this moment in the past. The reason why we're here today is because the artists are alive, the artists are living, the artists are still making work. And we can talk about this in the present tense. We can look back, but we can also be here in this moment and think about what the work meant then and what their ongoing practice means today. Um, and there was one artist, I think this is probably our segue moment. I think we need to, stage, exactly. There I was thought one that was artist my uh, to whom we devoted a solo room based on an installation that she made in 1973. And um, I think we should hand over to Betty Saar and Alison Saar now. <laughs> <laughs>